who for Israel bled out of the darkest land your ransom people led our fainting souls sustained with blessing from above and ever on your people reign the man of your love spirit of gospel grace fill your purpose here guard feed and give us faith and teach us lord to fear our fainting souls sustain with blessing from above and ever on your people reign the man of your love desert way lead us by your light our cooling cloud by day a warming fire by night our fainting souls sustain with blessing from above and ever on your people reign the man of your love our fainting souls sustain with blessing from above and ever on your people reign the man of your love It is quite a privilege and an honor to be singing and playing and then speaking. Um, I, I knew that R.C. was crazy, but uh, when he asked a musician to come speak, that solidified it. By my side here is Henry Hafner. Henry and I work at Parish Presbyterian Church in Franklin, Tennessee. Please give Henry a warm welcome. I will be speaking for a little while on uh, music and writing music. Uh, I thought I would start out with that song that I wrote, Pascal Lamb, and now I'm going to sing one that I did not write. The text comes from the 4th century, uh, Grecian in, uh, in its roots, and the, the melody is French, a folk melody called Picardy. And it is a beautiful melody that I know many of you will know and love and want to use it as an example for where we are headed this evening. yet born of Mary. As of old on earth he stood, Lord of 
of lords in human vesture, in the body and the blood. He will give to all the faithful his own self for heaven. Rank on rank the host of heaven Spreads its vanguard on the way As the light of light descendeth From the realms of endless day That the powers of hell may vanish as the darkness clears away. voice they cry Alleluia 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 Lord Most High Thank you I must admit that I am far more nervous two feet this way than right there, and without my guitar between me and you, I feel very vulnerable at the moment. Um, my name is Nathan. I have a wife, Patsy, and six children. Uh, Jonathan, my eldest, is here today with me this weekend, and uh, the rest of my family is back in Franklin, uh, Tennessee. Um, our only Paschal Lamb is, the, Lamb is the song that I began with, and it is the, uh, one of the songs off a brand new project I've been working on called To Live is Christ, and it's a collection of 11 psalms and 11 hymns or songs, depending on your definition. And I, I'm excited about that. I'm looking forward to playing a few more for you at the close of my talk. Um, the title of my talk is Music, Writing, and Dominion, or Music, Writing as Dominion, or Dominion in Music, Writing, or Composition, or something like that. Uh, it's a dangerous thing to give this subject to, of all people, a musician. The hammer soon sees all things as nails. The great temptation to the musician is to hold music and songwriting in extremely high esteem and say that if we get our music right, all will be right with the world. Here's a good reminder. Genesis 4, 17. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And a few verses later, Adah bore Jabal, and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. It is a good reminder to musicians to note that we descend from the line of Cain. I will attempt to keep this in mind as I propose a way to think about music and especially congregational music and dominion. This talk is really more about a way or an approach to think about music in its congregational 
context. Musicians, whether they know it or not, have a great influence on culture. It would be a mistake to not at least mention the innate power of music. Music both reflects and directs a culture. It seems to have innate influence, and therefore, there is an aspect of music that just takes dominion just because, especially when in conjunction with ideas. And it has been used for that, to move people. Uh, did you know the bagpipes, as far as I know, are the only instrument listed as a weapon of war? <laughs> An instrument of war. For this talk, I am pulling from folks like David Hall and Marvin Padgett, Andrew Sadlin, Doug Wilson, John Frame, Gordon Clark, George Grant, and of course, uh, the Sprouls. And though his name may not fit, and it's already come up once or twice today, Karl Barth and his addresses on Mozart. Obviously, with such a title as Music and Dominion, one could take several different approaches. We could talk about uh, music being our rallying cry. We could spend an hour evaluating the worldview of certain songs. We could attempt to evaluate the influences of and the influences that lead to the writing of particular songs. Or we could dissect instrumental pieces and philosophies and the philosophies that shape the minds of those who wrote the music. We could also look at the character of songwriters and composers to see if they stand up to the scrutiny of God's moral demands, and in all likelihood, we could castigate as worthless many of the Wagners and the Cole Porters and the Kurt Cobains that have littered the airwaves of music history. When it comes to one's moral standing, we could cast many stones, and I will allow you to cast the first. However, this, full, uh, this approach of a full-on critique would be akin to taking an hour to say how wrong abortion is without ever saying how much God loves life and how much He loves little children. It would be akin to taking an hour to say how wrong divorce is and never get around to saying how wonderful marriage is and how amazingly fulfilling the true purpose of marriage is. Also, to say that just writing and playing, uh, the writing and playing of music is taking dominion is probably too broad, even though he is an imitator, Satan is a creative musician. At least we know he's creative in his deceptive arts. On the other hand, to say that taking dominion with music can only happen when we sing psalms is probably too narrow. Moses and all the people of Israel sang a folk song in worship to the Lord, a folk song about chariots and water and death and escape. The Carter family and Johnny Cash were not the first to come up with a good story song. Perhaps there should be a different focus, perhaps trying to figure out just what we can and can't sing would be wrong-headed, just as it would be wrong-headed to say how much God hates stealing without ever saying that God loves giving. So if these are not my uh, focus, what is my focus? I will attempt to say this, that the law of God, that is the Word of God and the worship of God is the fertile soil in and out of which a musician cultivates a culture of worship that reflects God's character. I'll repeat that. I will attempt to say that the law of God, that is the Word of God, and the worship of God is the fertile soil in and out of which a musician cultivates a culture of worship that reflects God's character. The first idea I would like to drive home is that in order to see our music even begin to fill, fulfill part of the dominion mandate, we must love God's law. First of all, I, I'm a musician. I have been for most of my life, and given the current milieu, it may seem strange that an artist would, first of all, hold up law, convention, and truth as the starting point. And yet, I firmly believe that in this is true freedom. I'm not a theologian or a philosopher, as my 
father or my grandfather. My grandfather was Gordon Haddon Clark, a remarkable man, especially if you don't like him. He thought, of course, that language was the highest or most specific form of communication and that music, conversely, was the lowest <laughs> and that the guitar was the lowest form of music. Oh, how far his grandson has fallen. And yet the very thing he, uh, he based his thought upon is the same for the musician that is interested in seeing his craft fulfill this dominion mandate. My grandfather's work was to construct a philosophy based upon the Word of God, the law of God, the truth of the Scriptures. He had to take all of the Scriptures into account, not just the feel-good portions. He said this, man bears God's own image, dogs don't. I still love dogs, Dachshunds and St. Bernard's. But God gave man a reasonable or rational soul. Man can learn mathematics. Dogs can't. I still love dogs, Doberman Pinschers and Toy Manchesters. Further, dogs, not to speak of trees and stones, cannot be righteous or holy. To them, the Ten Commandments and the biblical requirements for worship do not apply. But man was created with the law of God written in his heart. So for Clark, the Ten Commandments and the biblical requirements do apply to man, and the law of God is of utmost importance. Or jumping back in history just a little bit, John Calvin also took all the Scriptures into account when he constructed a theology and wrote how that might affect the way we live, that is, our culture, religion externalized. This close look, this, this paying attention to, this, this fascination with, this understanding of the law of God or the Word of God caused the flowering of Christian culture. Though Calvin himself really didn't have much to say on music, and in fact, he even disparaged it in some ways, it was his emphasis on all walks of life, the value of all walks of life based in the Scriptures that gave new meaning to architecture, the governmental sphere, the home, mundane daily tasks, and of course, the arts. Or as I recently gleaned from my pastor, George Grant, William Tyndale put it this way, if we look externally, there is a difference betwixt the washing of dishes and preaching of the Word of God. But as touching to please God in relation to His call, none at all. An often quoted statement from Cornelius Van Til is, the Bible is authoritative on everything of which it speaks. Moreover, it speaks of everything. Now before we go too far and make the mistake of saying, after Calvin came Christian music, that takes dominion. Remember, my point is that it is the love of the law of God that gave rise to men and women, reflecting God's character in worship and thereby in culture. Was it perfect? No. But aspects of God's nature were newly celebrated in society. I don't pretend to think that I can survey uh, all of culture in history. I'll leave that to the scholars, but I do know something from the Psalms. I'd like to take us to Psalm number 27, starting at verse 4. The psalmist says this, one thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. And elsewhere, the psalmist says this, Psalm 119, verse 97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalm 119, 113 says, I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. And later, I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. You see, there is something here that our fighting antinomian and theonomic friends sometimes miss. It's a love of God's words that turns into a love of God's character, that turns into a love of God Himself. We all agree that we should not abuse grace, and we should all agree that we are not to be little dominionists running around killing as many mosquitoes and wolves as possible. 
Instead, we are to be lovers of God, knowing His nature and doing that which naturally extends from His character. And that should drive us to use a cultivating care as we work to deal with mosquitoes, wolves, pythons in the Everglades, and songwriting. It changes our natures so that the way we compose and play reflects something of the nature and character of the creator of the universe. Music as dominion begins to take shape as we reflect God's character, and we can only reflect God's character if we are bathed in His Word and in His ways. Now, perhaps if I were a, a very inspirational speaker, I could have come up with a speech that would inspire many to become musicians and thereby change the world. However, I would rather inspire one or two musicians to simply love God's law, the Psalms, the Proverbs, the stories of redemption, the law of love we find in Christ, to think God's thoughts after Him. Then, the test of what is good and bad for the musician who is a Christian would then no longer be the current cult cultural trends and taboos. The test of what is good, what is truthful, what is beautiful, and what actually fulfills our global mandate becomes the very nature of God found in His Word. Or to put it negatively, we cannot expect our music to take godly dominion if we do not know God. That's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. To put it more bluntly, if we do not love the redemptive patterns and stories of the Scriptures, if we are not spending time pondering the sacrificial love of Christ on the cross, if we do not recognize the strain of mercy and justice and beauty and anger and love and long-suffering in redemptive history, how in the world can we expect the gospel to be known, seen, felt, or heard, or understood in what we write, sing, or play, or compose, or draw, or write. If we only pay attention to Joab spilling the entrails of the stomach on the first blow, we will only have death metal bands. If we exclusively meditate on Psalm 23, we'll only have Debussy to listen to. If we only read Paul's long and logical sentences, we will only have Bach which may not be such a bad thing. If our habit starts and ends with uh, David's dancing, we will only have some Hebrew and Irish music and a little bit of Mozart. <laughs> My first point as it relates to us flaky musicians is that we must love God's Word, all of it. Of course, our problem may not be that we're paying too much attention to Joab. Our problem may be that we don't know Joab at all. Rather than by God's Word, we are captivated and consumed by the latest technological advances, and while many of these inventions are rooted in convention, we busy ourselves desperately trying to cast off the cords, to break the chains. And this is best seen, perhaps, in the world of the arts visual, musical, written. As a culture, we're doing our best to throw off the cords of convention, and while at the same time uh, seeking for invention and newness and novelty, we have become fully modern, fully enlightened, knowing that what we feel about the subject is the truth, if there is such a thing at all. Dominion, truth, law, convention, and objective beauty have nothing to do with us moderns, or more accurately, we will have nothing to do whatever with them. Do you remember the song, Don't Fence Me In? Great uh, little Western tune. I, I love the song, and I love big sky country and big spaces, and it's a great tune. But it will serve as my antagonist for the moment. Uh, in a sense, don't fence me in has become the philosophical norm of the day. Don't tell me what is normal. Don't restrict my self-expression with convention. Don't tell me what is good and right and beautiful. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. 
Your truth is not my truth. Autonomy, self-enlightenment, and tolerance are the Trinitarian tenets of the current cultural religions. Dr. Grant says, you know the gods of a culture by the sins of a culture, those things which you must not do or say. If, there, if I say there is one truth, I have sinned. If I say there is one way is right and one way is wrong, I have sinned. If I say beauty, marriage, and truth is defined by God in the Scriptures, I have committed the unforgivable sin. Autonomy is God the Father. Self-enlightenment is God the Son. Selective tolerance is the holy self-comforter. Of course, if you're not led by the same Spirit that leads me, you are intolerant and you should probably be marginalized. The psalmist says something very different. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep His testimonies, who seek Him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in His ways. You have commanded your precepts to keep them diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes, then I shall not be put to shame. Having my eyes fixed on all your commandments, I will praise you with an upright heart. When I learn your righteous rules, I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me." You know, this does not sound like someone who is trying to cast off the cords. As I was thinking about this and thinking about Don't Fence Me In, I, I penned these words for a different project. Wash out the trails that ever tempt. Place me within the tallest fence. I'm certain now that only then can I truly live. It is the task of the modern to cast off chains. It's the task of the Christian to refine them. As the psalmist says, our eyes must be fixed on God's commands. A new leather boot, I, I love boots. I was in the airport in, in Nashville coming down here and I saw a guy's boots. I, was, I just had to go talk to him about his boots. And I, I walked up to him and said, hi, I, I really like your, your boots. What kind of boots are those? And they were Tony Lamas. And I looked at him and I said, I know you. And he's like, hi, I'm Rick Santorum. I was like, hi, I'm, I'm Nathan George. I like your boots. <laughs> I didn't tell him that I voted for Ron Paul. <laughs> but leather can be painful at first. Over time, your boots become your favorite shoes. So it is with God's Word. In the preface to his commentary uh, on, on the… On, uh, the commentary on the Psalms, John Calvin wrote, Moreover, although the Psalms are replete with all the precepts which serve to frame our life to every part of holiness, piety, and righteousness, yet they will principally teach and train us to bear the cross. And the bearing of the cross is a genuine proof of our obedience, since by doing this we renounce the guidance of our own affections and submit ourselves entirely to God, leaving Him to govern us and to dispose of our life according to His will, so that the affections which are the bitterest and most severe become sweet to us because they proceed from Him. Musicians with an eye to glorify Christ and culture and worship must let go of the current idea ideal even of being an artiste, known for the novel. And instead, we must grab hold of the calling to be an artisan who finds fulfillment in refining conventions based in the character of God. Why is Bach and Mozart just so wonderful? Because they took the tools and made them the best that they could be. Offense is freedom, and this is not doublespeak, for without convention there is no invention. 
Without borders, there is no security. Without regularity, there is no irregularity. Without the mundane, there is no miraculous. Without the normal, there is no surprise. You might have thought the musician was going to play all day. Without law, there is no gospel. Extremes without restraint show themselves for what they are, devoid of God. We must love God's Word, all of it. So how do we proceed? It may not be enough to say, read the Bible, and all will be well. The psalmist said, one thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Musicians that desire to see the gospel affect the world must be gazing on the beauty of the Lord. They must be bathing in the regular preaching of the gospel. They must be regularly engaged in worship. They must regularly and humbly meet with God. Otherwise, they will find themselves always answering the fool according to his folly. If our songs are shaped more by what unbelievers hate than by what God loves, we will become ingrown with the world. And this goes both ways. If we acquiesce to the skeptics, we will begin to sound just like them. And if we are intent on saying the exact opposite of the skeptics, we have still allowed them the terms of the argument. If, on the other hand, we are listening to the Word of God regularly and worshiping Him regularly, we will be able to say without apology what God loves. And by His grace, we will be able to say that we love God. The Scriptures call us to worship, and in worship, our first task, obligation, and privilege is to gaze upon the Lord. From that flows confession, praise, supplication, mission, transformation, and a decent song or two. It is interesting to me that Psalm 27 becomes incredibly earthy and practical as it continues, moving from this gazing upon the Lord to, teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me. They breathe out violence. Weekly worship that relies fully on the Scriptures is the primary way we are shaped, changed, and gain a new appreciation for God's ways, His level paths, and His nature. In other words, in order for a musician to take part in the godly cultivation of the world, he must be being cultivated by God. Dr. Grant says, worship is the fountainhead of all other gospel activity. The musician that desires to cultivate a Christ-centered culture, must know God's Word, must commune with Him regularly in order to exhibit God's nature in what we compose or play. Uh, my last point before I make a few practical suggestions and give a few practical examples uh, has to do with dominion and the word dominion. Uh, now, I, I keep using this word cultivation. Uh, and, and I will admit that what I'm about to say may only be half the story when it comes to the word dominion, but this word dominion has been drugged through the mud for years, and so I would like to ask a question that uh, Dr. Sproul has already alluded to. When rather than what? So when was the original dominion mandate given? It was before we felt the need to fog mosquitoes. It was before we felt the need to uh, beat back thorns. It was before we needed to label our meat in our supermarkets. It was before the pythons helped themselves to the Everglades. It was before the bagpipes needed to call us to war. It was before sin. This to me signifies an emphasis, 
and perhaps even part of the definition of dominion. Now, I, I, I did begin by saying I'm not a theologian, so I, I'll say this by saying I like to think of dominion in this way. 50% cultivation and care and discipleship and a wise and prudent application of knowledge and justice. 49% would be pushing back sin with mercy and good works. And maybe 1% would be defensive war. Like a roaring lion, Proverbs 28, 15, but like a roaring lion or a charging bear is a wicked ruler over a poor people. A ruler who lacks understanding is a cruel oppressor. Conversely, a good ruler's dominion is marked with grace and wisdom and mercy and understanding. Adam and Eve were placed in the garden and called to be fruitful. It's hard to imagine that Adam's next step was to build a deer stand and take dominion from 15 feet up. That's not a word against hunting, but I would like to reshape the way we think about how we care for God's creation. Instead, the original man mandate has to do more with naming and cultivating. As it relates to the musician, through a love of the Word and regular worship, the musician is shaped, formed, and renewed into one that cares for and cultivates musical settings and compositions that enable and promote biblical, meaningful, and vibrant congregational worship. Now, uh, just an aside before I jump into some playing. Uh, it's good to write, of course, on all kinds of subjects. Um, why is it good for Andrew Peterson to sing about his boys discovering the world of make-believe in the backyard? Why do songs like this resonate with us? Because they're rooted in the love of life, of children, of discovery and creation. They're rooted in the very character of God. The law of God written on our hearts comes through in songs like this. It would, I would love to take an hour to look at this folk song and look at that folk song, but I want to focus in a little bit on how this relates to congregational worship. And so I have some practical suggestions, and then I'll play an example. I've written uh, several songs over the last couple of years for Parish Presbyterian Church. Uh, we, we sing a psalm of the month, and so I try to write a new setting of a psalm uh, almost every month. Maybe I get nine or ten out of the year. And it's been a great practice, and I've really enjoyed it. Um, and, and let me say this, I've done my best to stay out of the worship wars. I think I've done that here this evening. But I do have, I think, some practical suggestions that I hope will help. First, the focus of congregational music, and I've spent most of my talk saying this already, should be God's Word for our singing, in almost all cases, is prayer. Our focus should be on the Lord Himself, for our singing, in almost all cases, is prayer. When we speak in prayer, we usually spend less ta time talking about how we feel and more time thinking about how God might think and feel on the subject. Therefore, most of our music and its text for congregational worship should be God-oriented, much like our spoken prayer. Lexio Divina, praying through the Scriptures. Second, this is an obvious one, remember it's congregational. It's not individualistic pop or classical music. I have had several people ask if they, would, if they could use the, my, my early settings of the Psalms. And my early settings of Psalms were for performance and for meditation for the individual on a CD. They're, they're for presentation. And they'd come to me and say, hey, can we sing Psalm 111 in worship? And I would reply with, good luck. <laughs> That's going to be a train wreck. I've visited a lot of churches in the U.S. playing music and, and, and playing in worship. 
And I've noticed a phenomenon that's just repeated over and over again. When, in many churches, as people are singing songs, they learn from the radio uh, and various artists, the singing is lackluster at best. Now, that's not a critique of those songs per se. I'm just noticing something as I travel. The singing is lackluster. Part of the problem is that the radio and favorite artists only hit a select group of people in the congregation because they're the ones listening, so that's just a practical issue. Uh, part of the problem is inherent to the music. And I've also visited churches that would be considered high church, same phenomenon. The singing might be lackluster. Then in both contexts, as they switch to a come thou found, a holy, 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 a be thou my vision, the place erupts. And when you see this happen over and over and over again, you realize there's, there's something going on more than just everybody knows this tune. Now, there could be a few uh, examples that break the mold, but I would say that generally speaking, style is not the inhibitor. The purpose of the music is the inhibitor. What's the music for? Is it for personal meditation? Wonderful. Is it for the purpose of bringing the congregation together? Great. Is it for the purpose of overwhelming you with a sense of holiness from the chorals? Then great. But they have three distinct purposes and settings. Once in a while, you'll find a song that breaks the mold, and it works in all three. But I have learned firsthand that many things don't work. My poor congregation in uh, Franklin, Tennessee has had to put up with me experimenting on them, and I'll write a song. It's like, here, I love this song, and I'll bring it to Henry, and here, let's learn this tune. And Henry will say, well, that might not be very singable. <laughs> and so we go back to the drawing board, and we think about the purpose for this piece of music. Now, there's certainly room to train, to learn, to work hard, to come together, to get a hold of that piece that's difficult, but there's a reason that Come Thou Fount is going nowhere soon. It's singable. It seems so obvious, and yet when we're trying to put in all kinds of syncopation and, and melodic jumps, uh, just to make it interesting, perhaps we should trash it and start over. So much of our modern attempt at worship, whether we're talking classical music or pop music, has much more in common with Madonna than, say, the Carter family. Why? Because the latest shock artist is more about self-expression. The Carter family wrote songs people could sing. It's folk music. Music for the folks. It's hard for 500 people to get together and express their individually all at the same time, or the, their individualism all at the same time without it turning into chaos. If chaos is the goal, that's being achieved. Uh, are there classical examples? When was the last time your congregation or your music minister chose Handel's uh, Messiah and you all launched into it? It'd be a train wreck. There are practical things we can look at and say, this is congregational, and the purpose is to bring us together just as we come to the Lord's table, to commune together, to lift up our voices as one voice and bring glory to Christ. The question of style can be best answered by understanding, first of all, purpose and setting. I have a quick story and then my last point. Um, Philip of Macedonia, Macedonia was uh, conquering the lands of Greece in the northern part of, of Greece, and he sent a note to the Spartans saying, if I go down into your country, I will level your great city. And Spartans, known for their brevity, wrote back and said, if. <laughs> the, the last point that I would like to make is very short. 
Not quite that short. But it is sing the psalms. A pastor was visiting a pastor in Spain, and he noticed that his church was singing all psalms. So he asked him, why does your church sing all psalms? And the Spanish pastor said, well, I noticed a year ago or so that that we were singing just whatever. Someone would bring a nice tune and and adjust the words a little bit, baptize the melody, and and we'd have a new song for our worship. And someone would bring this song, and and we'd sing that. And someone would bring this song, and we'd sing that. And pretty soon I realized that our theological grounding was this and that and this and that. And so I, I talked to the leaders of the church, and they said, yeah, let's Let's sing the psalms for a while. And the theological grounding of his congregation took a complete 180 in a year because they were singing the psalms. Now, I do not fall into the exclusive psalmody camp, but I will say that it's really difficult to overemphasize the need to sing the psalms. Is it never? Is it once every few weeks that you sing the psalms? Is it once a Sunday? Does it fill up 50% of your singing each Sunday? Where are you in singing the psalms? Christ's prayer book. Christ's song book. With that, I'd like to sing Psalm 6 and then hold up an example. Henry, come on up. Let's sing. Welcome to turn there, Psalm 6. Gently, gently lay your rod on my sinful heart, O God. Stay your wrath in mercy, stay, or I sink before its sway. Heal me, for my flesh is weak. Heal me, for your grace I see. This my only plea I make, heal me for your mercy's sake. My soul is in great distress, send, O oh, send your promise rest. Lord, I cry how long, how My great need has been my song. Look, O Lord, with gracious eye. Turn and take my guilty life. By your grace from heaven above, save me in your steadfast love. So depart from me away, men of evil be ashamed, for the Lord has heard my cry, as my prayer ascends on high, lo, he comes, he heeds my plea, lo, he comes, the shadows flee. Glory round me dawns once more. Rise, my spirit, and adore.
For the Lord has heard my cry, has my prayer ascends on high. Lo, He comes, He heeds my plea. Lo, He comes, the shadows flee. Glory round me dawns once more. Rise, my spirit, and adore. As I, I mentioned, in as I was speaking. Um, I get to experiment on Parish Presbyterian Church, and I get to write for them almost monthly and try it out in worship. And once in a while, we, we hit on something that, that just really works. Many, many times we hit on something that works pretty well and people like it all right. And then once in a while, you hit something that just plum flops. And uh, I, I'm not going to sing this whole thing, but I'd like to uh, g give you just a taste of something that flopped. Is that all right? Uh, I, I, uh, th this is this hour and 20 I was surprised you all gave me an hour and, and 20 minutes. It's really dangerous to have a musician standing in front of you and speaking for that long. Um, but this will give you a taste of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about setting and purpose. What is the purpose of the music we bring to the congregation? It is to bring us together so that we can lift up the name of the Lord as one voice. And when you sing things like this, it becomes many voices doing their own thing, and they're fairly scattered. Uh, I, I love syncopation, and I wrote this melody that goes like this. You want to just play it once, then I'll sing it. You want D minor? Okay. All right. So it's a nice, nice melody. I really like it. It's got some groove, and I actually wrote it on the, on the piano, and it moves uh, very nicely on the piano. But it sings like this: Unto you, o Lord, unto you I lift my soul. Nice by myself, but if you all tried to sing it, this is what I found with uh, my congregation. I sing unto you, o Lord, which feels easy. But everybody wants to sing it. Unto you, O Lord. They want to drop down. So a practical consideration as you bring music. I love this song I just heard. Can we sing this in worship? The musician might go, well, maybe. Or they might go, yeah, let's do it. And then you wonder why it didn't work. Because it's not singable as a group. It may be very singable in your car. And that's wonderful. Sing at the top of your lungs in your car. And so uh, we, we sang this all month. We've been singing it for four Sundays, and this coming Sunday is the last Sunday. And um, I'll probably retire that one. <laughs> I'd like to sing one, though, uh, as I um, begin to wrap this up. One that did sing very, very well. People latched onto it very quickly. And I love this psalm. It's, it's an odd psalm, Psalm 14. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And I mentioned something in my talk that I'll, I'll bring up here, Lexia Divina. It, it is, a, is a, a discipline of reading and praying through the Scriptures. And so my rendition of Psalm 14 here is not Psalm 14 as you find in your Scriptures. It is my reflection of Psalm 14, my prayer based on time in Psalm 14. And actually, uh, Henry and I sat down together to work on this as we sort of fleshed out how Psalm 14 hits us, and then we worked on the melody together as well. Psalm 14. Lord, 
protect your people, save our foolish hearts. Look down from heaven, we will not depart. Through Christ the Lord's salvation, from Zion till has come and heals his chosen nation and leads the outcast home. Don't the wicked understand they must call the Lord. God is with the righteous, refuge of the poor. Through Christ the Lord's salvation, from Zion till has come, and heals his chosen nation, and leads outcast everyone has turned aside all have gone astray none of us is good not one Seek us, Lord, all our days Through Christ the Lord's salvation From Zion still has come And heals His chosen nation And leads the outcast home Through Christ the Lord's salvation from Zion till has come and heals his chosen nation and leads the outcast home and leads the outcast In closing, my first effort was to show that in order to see our music begin to fulfill part of the dominion mandate, we must love God's law, His word, His conventions, His character. My second effort was to remind us that we need to be shaped and transformed by the gospel, regular worship and communion with God. My third effort was to point out that dominion is in large part cultivation and care, and I might add love and mercy and responsibility. God calls the church musician to name, to distinguish, to know the purpose of a song, to care for and to cultivate musical settings and compositions that enable and promote biblical, meaningful, and vibrant congregational worship. The application of these three points is that the Word of God and the worship of God must be the fertile soil in and out of which a musician cultivates a culture of worship that truly reflects something of God's nature. My practical suggestions based on these foundations were our focus must be as prayer on the Lord Himself and on His Word. The second one was remember it's congregational. The third one was remember style is not so much the issue, the purpose is the issue. Fourthly, sing the Psalms, write from the Psalms make them a fixture before the eyes 
of your congregation. May Christ direct his church. Thank you for your attention.